Okay, because we have a local speaker today before introducing uh, Let me just say that we need a few more speakers for next semester, so if you have any good name in mind, uh, just let me know. And, uh, and even local speakers, so I think we have no, no nomination for a local speaker next semester, so if you know someone that did something interesting or is returning or something, let me know. Okay, so without further interruption, it's my pleasure to introduce Moira Chas from Stockholm. Okay, so let me first say, let's not say questions to the end. Now, if you have any doubt or questions, this should be clear. So if it, I'm going to take a quiz at the end, so maybe you ask me for it. Okay, so what I'm, I'm going to talk about is some math uh, that I did that it was, I mean, Oh, it's joint work with some people and my computer. My computer, this one is my name, collaborate. Oh, sometimes they also collaborate with the computer here. But anyway, oops, this is my summary. I'm going to see. So, let's start with the surface. This is topological torus. It has a boundary component. And to study this surface, I'm going to cut it up. The way I cut it up is I put arcs that run between, well, in this case, there's only one boundary component. And they are they have no crossings and they don't cross each other. And then you know just go with a scissor and cut it up and there's some labels that you see these little letters. So at the beginning the labels are just a memory of how I glue. I'm gluing always in the orientable way, so everything you know that I'm going to do is orientable. And uh, once I have this surface, you know, in this flat mode, I can record these letters here, this cyclic sequence of letters, in this case is small a, small b, capital A, capital B, and that's really the surface, really has all the topological secrets of the torus, if I know, I can remember the, the gluing algorithm. So this, uh, this sequence of letters is a surface word, and, um, and it determines a pair of generators in the fundamental group, and now you see why I choose this lowercase capital case. Parenthesis, uh, for me, uppercase means A minus 1, which is much nicer to write if you're working with a computer. So, uh, oops, sorry, the arrow here is backwards. So the generator that mine by A should be with the arrow pointed, so it's start at this base point, come here, then you go to the point that is blue, come back here. That's the A generator, and other ones with the B generator, which has the arrow pointed in the correct way. So now that we fix, you know, our surface and the surface word, let's look at a, a curve. All the curves I'm going to study up to free homotopy, up to continuous deformation. And now it does make sense to look at this curve in this cut-up surface. So we can attach. Uh, to the curve, a certain cyclic word. Of course, I'm not doing any curves. I'm going to choose a member of the free homotopy class that doesn't do things like coming back here, you know, enter from here and coming back. I'm not doing these inefficient moves. My curves are tight. So to see what word I get uh, labeled the free homotopy class, you start at any point, say here, go to the edge later by A, so you record an A. You always record where you enter. So you record the A, come out here, A again, come out here, A for the third time, these are the three A's, and then I am here, B, small a, and so on. So that is a curved word. We have two different things. You know, there's two different type of words that have, you know, they're both cyclic, but they are very different. The surface word is a word that is going to have two N letters, where N is the number of generators, and every letter on this two N, uh, every, see, every letter in this two N alphabet appears exactly once. This one is a word that has to be reduced. This is this condition that I don't have any look like this. And, uh, Anyway, so that's, that's, a, that's a curve word. And since it's very painful to write things in a cyclic manner, I will, you know, write it this way, but you should think of the air. This is a cyclic word, even if I write it in a linear way. 
So these three numbers one can associate with a curve word easily. I mean, or three numbers that are interesting. So what is the stock intersection number? So this is you look at the free multiple class and find what is the smallest number of crossings occurring that class has, so the self-intersection number. If you have a crossing something like this, you count down as three because you wiggle a little bit and this is, this is it. The other number is the word length. Now the word length you have it when, you know, you, you need a, a choice of generators of the fundamental group. I'm only going to use the choice of, of, of minimal generators and uh, this is the same as choosing the, the surface word. And then if you have a metric on the surface, you can associate the length of the shortest curve on that surface. And uh, the metrics I'm going to consider are always you know, constant negative curvature. So these are the three numbers, and many of the things I did are you know, study interactions, statistics relating to these three numbers. And anyway, this is the notation that I kept from the past, I can't get rid of it, so it's there. Pi zero is a, is a set of real homotopy classes. It's, I call it pi zero because it's a, it's a set of components of the free loop space, which was my first lab, and you know, one. Okay, so let's start counting curves using these numbers. So if you want to count, you know, how many uh, free homotopy classes. You have now a, a surface with a certain hyperbolic metric, and you want to count how many free homotopy classes you have up to geometric length L. So that number as many people who contributed it to solve. Margulis is probably the, the main. And this grows, the number of such curves grows like A, A to the HL divided by HL. And H is a number between 0 and 1. Is one when you have a closed surface, and in general, H is the what is the entropy of the geodesic flow, and it's all well, maybe yeah, don't go there. You can ask me later if you're curious about this this H. And the genus of the surface. Doesn't What's that? The genus of the surface or the always always. The genus of the surface surprisingly doesn't have any influence. Nope. Uh, so it's just yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, it's. Now, if we want to do the same count, it's not hard. If you do the same count, instead of counting by geometric length, you want to count by the word length. Well, you know, how many words you have until uh, of uh, length L? You know, you, let's say it's a linear word. You can put two n letters in the first letter, then you have two n minus one because your word is reduced, so you multiply by two n minus one, two n minus one over and over until you get two n minus one to the L. And uh, since it's a cyclic word, you divide it by L. I'm always thinking in words that are not power of all curves, that are not powers of other words, but those are not that many, so they're going to have a way to this count. This is just asymptotics, meaning that the quotient of these numbers goes to 1 when L goes to infinity. But in the previous thing about the number of GDs, what's the, what's the little H? H is the entropy of the geodesic flow, and also it's the dimension you know, if you look at uh, if you look at the universal cover of your surface, this is always for a surface with boundary. The H is smaller is smaller than one. And you look at the limit set corresponding to the function group. One way to get it is you lift all the take all the liftings to this cover of the closed geodesic, and then mark the endpoints. Take the closure of that. That's a Cantor set. And uh, the dimension of that counter set is also H. I see, so the, but you don't choose a complete metric on the interior, you instead are choosing a, a, a you take an hyperbolic metric yes. that but the, the but the boundary is actually at finite distance, it's not up, up infinity. The boundary? You say you look at so no, 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 the boundary is at infinity, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you take a complete metric on the interior. Yes. But yeah, then you have to sleep all geodesics and look at the endpoints. And you know, take a closure, and uh, that's that's a, that's a, how that's a counter set, and the Hauser dimension is the H. This the H. Sorry, <coughs> I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning, so it's, you hear worse things. 
So uh, now, just to warm up and see what can one do with a computer, so we have this count of all geodesics up to length L. So what I did is, for a few metrics, in this case, well, there's a certain particular metrics, I just really computed all geodesics up to a certain length and plot them. So this first figure is in the pair of pants. This is a pair of pants with a hyperbolic metric, and the length of the boundary components are there. It's 2.5, 2.6, and 5. Then the red points there are points of the form L and how many geodesic you have until that L in this metric. So everything, you know, math fits with what is proven, which is pretty pleasant. And uh, and the blue is a factor. <laughs> What's that? The blue is the uh... and the blue, I'll say what it is. I mean, clearly this is exponential, and I'll say for this, you know, in a second what it is, that these are 8 million, <laughs> you know, it's amazing that the computer, it had to, well, look at all, much more words than that, 8 million <coughs> compute the length of each of those, and count, you know, it's, really admire that. This is, uh, for a torus with a geodesic boundary component, and it's a torus, a certain torus with, the generator have length 14 and 16. Uh, this is a little more wiggly, but still, you know, clearly exponential. And then what I did is I did a backward process. So, so the, the question I was asking before, so on a, on a torus with a hole, I would have thought that you would take the hyperbolic metric on the interior, but apparently not doing that. You're saying you no, 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 so it's made with geodesic boundary. Yeah, all my, the surfaces, you know, they need to have geodesic boundary. Otherwise, I think that the, the limit set is the whole thing. You have, to, you have, you don't have to remove your just little points, but the closure of it will give you the whole uh, circular infinity. I think Claude's question is that the, uh, the the formula in yellow in the yellow box up there yeah. is is for uh, complete metrics. Metrics, well, yeah. Uh, no, it works for surfaces that can have geodesic boundary. It does also. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. This, this is a torus with geodesic boundary. So that, the question I was asking before was... Okay, okay, I, I misunderstood. I thought you were asking something about the car. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because what happens when you have a boundary, you know, it's just you, you have... So if you do the torus here. So we're going to attach this with this and this with this. And then the boundary is going to be the perpendicular made, made of pieces uh, of colors. Well, here is only one boundary if I glue it the way I said. So these are perpendicular. But then you're going, so, you know, this piece here is, uh, this is an open set here that is not going to be in the limit set. These are out. So now, you're going to keep repeating this picture here. I, I have these three discs, you know, I map them. These are these three. I do my hyperbolic transformation, mapping the whole picture inside here, for instance. So the, now I have this, these three things, you know. Every, this, I move it on this half circle. I move it over here. So this, this two and this come inside here. And then they're going to have again this pieces of the boundary here. Here, this one comes here. And then these are little open sets that are removed. And then I keep doing that over and over and over. So you're removing this. So is that the same as you could have originally taken your hyperbolic surface with boundary and then just reflect it to add another example? If you've got a torus with a hole, you can think of that as half the surface of genus 2. Is that the same picture? In the no, I don't think so. I don't think so because the structure, I don't want to stay a lot here, but the structure of this, you know, here you have a counter set, the complement is much bigger because this is a counter set. And if you add the double, the double, you wouldn't, you get things that are different. So, no. And the, the, the entropy here is, it, it, 
it's not the volume entropy. That, that would be just the same for all hyperbolic things, right? So it's, it's, it's. The entropogenesis flow. Anyway, so this was to, uh, the trickiest I wanted to estimate I, and you can do it, you know, just compute this if you want to do it by hand. It's, it's really painful. So I think one can get a good idea, maybe this is something I'd like to explore or have something to explore someday. So this is just to remind you how complicated curves can be. Everybody knows this curve probably. Um, I'll then just show you again my curve. So this is a simple curve in the sphere with four holes. It's a single curve, meaning that you know, if I go around, I can run around the curve without lifting my finger and come back where, where I started. It was painted at the Board of Berkeley by Dennis and Thurston. Yeah, it had to be painted on. Uh, painted over. Huh? Yeah, painted over. So, so. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know. That's why they gave us the painting. Yeah. So. The picture wants to illustrate how complicated curves with no crossings can be. This is a curve with no crossing, you know. Imagine, you know, many, many, many of those, the structure is complicated. And, you know, <laughs> many years people wanted to count. We know how to count all curves up to a certain geometric length. Well, what if we want to count only simple curves, only curves with no crossings? Can you estimate the number that we have until a certain geometric length L? And, uh, you know, there were many people, but the person who really did the big thing, uh, first of all, this is the illustration. I did the counting with simple curves, again, in the same, uh, this is in the torus, the pair of pants that has only three simple curves, so not interesting to count them. So this is what you get, the, the points, the red points, what I put what they are, well, the red point, oh, it's there, sorry, I'm just five in the morning, are points of the a length, and then how many geodesics without crossings you have until that length L. Each of red, the red points are that. And then in blue there's this quadratic function, which you know, illustrates the theorem that, uh, one of the many theorems that earned Marin Sakani the Fields Medal, that if you want to study the growth, the, the growth of, uh, Simple, uh, the simple closed curves on a surface with hyperbolic metric up to length L is like a constant that depends on the metric times L to a certain number that depends on the genus and the number of boundary components. So what, uh, can you just go back to the two slides uh, to, sure. to compare this one with the previous one? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is, I, I put these two together. Thank you. I, I hired me to ask it. No. Because you know, the, all the curves are exponential. If you look, look only the simple ones, polynomial. So then, we, you know, why stop at certain intersection zero? Oh, this is another thing. Look at my slide before talking. Uh, here is one thing that I plan to study. Uh, you see, this, instead of I'm, I'm kind of picturing the inverse function of that. So this is the point, the red points are an integer, and the, I, and the length of the k geodesic, you know, I order all the geodesics from the smallest to the largest. And then I make a function which is k length of the k geodesics. And this is what you get, you know, it's a square root, which is because there are two, you know, inverses. But the computer seems to be telling that this way of counting might be more accurate. And, you know, I don't have still a way to, you know, quantify my statement. I have to think of it. It's just that. This is the same picture, but now looking at the geodesics, with self-intersection one. And uh, I'm really, you know, uh, sometime after uh, Marina Sakani proved that indeed the growth is the same, you know, it's just growth like a uh, constant times, but he just, it, it's a little less strong, you know, the, the growth is 
abounded by constant times uh, LCG models. Same dimension of the tabular space. What, what is P? Yeah. Well, because you have two things. It's boundaries and punctures. Uh, punctures. Okay. I, I was going to remove the punctures to make it easier. I did it successfully did it all around. OK, so I'd like to uh, talk a little more about uh, Marian's result because uh, it's going to come up later. Also, uh, there was a, a Bibi Caralanson and Juan Soto uh, also proved something similar. I mean, the same result, but you know, they studied the metrics. I mean, the, the constant, the, the things they get, they are kind of, they say, orthogonal in some sense, the results. So, uh, she has, she proved that the role says some, oh, sorry, I'm being very chaotic. Now we pass through something that is very recently, it's not even in the archives, she proved the same theorem works for self-intersection K. So the growth of all geodesic with K crossings is again polynomial with a, you know, with the same degree of the simple curves. Uh, the coefficients, you know, as the certain intersection grow are much larger. You know, you need to make, <laughs> when you want the model, you, you get the exponential that we had in the beginning. So the, 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 this, this the, yeah, we had this PK, these are the ones that are going to grow. This B that depends on the metric is just a constant. And then um, this number there, BJ, BJB, it's, it's some uh, rational, uh, it's a rational times uh, some power of pi, some volume of the modular space and all of this uh, wonderful theorem she has. And, uh, you know, I would like to study the growth, and I'll show you some results in that regard of what happens when you, uh, instead of geometric length, put word length. You know, geometric length and word length are closely related, you know, there's a quasi-isometry. So you get bounds on this, but, you know, I would like a precise result, and I have some precise results. And this is just you know, another picture. You know, what happens when you take curves of larger surface intersections? And of course, this, this is the, the square root. It goes higher and higher. And the height seems to be the length of the shortest geodesic of that surface intersection. So for instance, we are looking at surface intersection 10, and this is about 200. So this, uh, this height here, is the length of the shortest geodesics with 30 surface intersection. This is a, you know, the order, you know, the geodesics order by length and just put in the uh, K and what appear. So now we're going to change topics a little bit, but in the same area. So let's come curse on the closed doors. So if I want to know how many free homotopy classes of closed curves I have of word length L, how many do I have? It's a question to the audience. Remember, the, 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 the fundamental group here is the free group in two generators A and B. So a free homotopy class has to be, it's a free abelian group. So a free homotopy, a free homotopy class is A to the something times B to the something. And if I ask you word L, well, the two sum things have to, I have to add up to L. So, easy count. Now, how many of those have no crosses? Two. Huh? Two? Well, these are all, the, I'm looking at all the curves, word length L. So let's, I think I have more pictures here. Let's look at it in the universal power. So here is one lap of a curve, you know, that goes, well, two times in the A direction, three times in the B direction. So it's A to the 2, B to the 3, with some sign that I'm not worrying about. What happens if I take the square of that curve? 
a to the 4, b to the 6. You see the picture here, I just have to, instead of taking one lap, I take two laps. It will be overlapping. How many crossings that square have? The square of the curve. If you look at it, in fact, if you look at it in the torus, it's easy to see. You go around, just look at the curve A, go around twice in the torus. How many crossings does it have? Curve. A square. Yes, it has one. <laughs> yes, it has one. I was hoping that's it, yes. If you go twice around, you have one crossing. If you go three times around, you have two crossings. If you go n times, guess what? So, uh, the way to get curves with no crossings is to have. Huh? is to have, you know, no power, so they have to be relatively prime. So, so the number of, uh, you know, relatively prime pairs is the same as the Euler phi function of L, and the Euler phi function is the set of numbers, the, 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 the cardinal of the set of numbers between 1 and L, which are relatively prime with L. And uh, there's a 2 because I can go in this direction or that direction. I'm taking unoriented, but you know, otherwise I would have a 4. You know? If you go to only the other phi, you just see one quadrant. Now, what happens when we have the punctual torus? Now, here, uh, the red dots are the boundary you know, of, of the punct of the, of the, of the torus. And I'm looking at the same curve. I can have the same label for that curve. Now this curve has no as much freedom to move around. You know, there's only one, you know, basically only one way to draw it because the sequence of letters I have to follow are A, B, you know, here is A, W, B, A, B, B, and then start over again. So that's that's a word. So how many symbols do I have in this case? That's a hard question. It's one can prove that if you give me a pair of relatively primes integers, there's only one simple curve which is has that in homology. You know, it's going to be in this case, you know, you see how to, uh, to put the A's and the B's distributed. The the form of the word is you know perfectly, I'm not going to go into this, but it's perfectly static, we know how it looks, and it's really interesting math that I almost decided to talk about that instead of this, but anyway, can't do everything. So since you know each you know pair of integers adding up to L and relatively prime has exactly one homotopy class, we again has two uh, times the Euler phi function of L curves. Simple curves in the pantry torus. And then there's this beautiful identity in number theory that says that if you add the order of function of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 uh, up to L, this grows like 3 times r squared divided by pi squared. And uh, so then this tells us, I'm going to call by the way this number, you know, 2 times 3 divided by pi squared c because it will up, come up again and again. So then, putting all things together, we see that the number of the number of simple geodesics in the punctual torus up to word length grows like this constant times a square. I mean, this the phi of L is an equality on the nodes. This is exactly how many they are. But when you are, this is not a really good approximation. The error here is L logarithm of L. So now. Let's look at well the simple curve, and let's start applying homeomorphisms to that simple curve. It, you know, there's many many curves we run. It turns out that for the torus, it's not hard to see that I will, if I apply homeomorphisms to the class, I will get all the possible uh, classes of simple curves. So this, we say there's one orbit 
and the homeomorphisms. And, uh, and then if I call C of L alpha, the number of curves in the orbit, or the, which are, you know, image under the homeomorphism of alpha and has, uh, have one length L, well, we just saw that if there's, you know, in the case this alpha is this curve here, this problem is C times uh, the, the Euler fifth function of L. Any question? Okay, now let's have more crosses. So one crossing, you know, what can happen? Well, one can see that basically there's two types of orbits, you know, under homeomorphisms in the functor torus. It's either this one that is kind of all twice around, and then, you know, make sure the boundary is in this kind of bygone that is formed, or make a loop around the boundary and then go around a single curve. These are the two possible orbits. If you have a curve with certain intersection, and the one certain intersection is the image under homeomorphism of one of these two. So how do they grow? By war length. And not, I'm hoping you don't answer that because it took me some time to figure it out. So if I want to study the growth of this, this one grows, the one that goes has a loop growing around the boundary, is 2 times c times the order fifth function of L minus 4. And the one that is, let's say, almost a square is 2 times c times the order fifth function of L divided by 2 and 0, you know, if the length is r. So I'll explain one of them in my next slide. So let's look at this one here. So here is a uh, a feature of the curve in a, in a cover of the punctual torus. The little squares there are, are, are the boundary. So you see my curve goes here, does this little loop, and comes here. This is one lap of the curve. Now if I chop, if I cut away that little loop, I get a simple curve. You know, if I just go here and continue, I get a simple curve. Now, how many letters do I lose when I cut that, that little loop? Well, since it goes around the boundary and I have these four arcs, which are the ones that record letters emanating from the boundary component, I lose exactly four letters. It's A, B, cap a, B capital A, capital B. So this is the L minus four. Now, it also happens that if, you, if we start with a simple curve here, and I want to see uh, how many of that curve can I construct with a simple curve, well, it tells us that I can make two, because I have to look the two, there's two pieces of curves that are the innermost, the closest most to the boundary component in a fundamental domain, and I can add the loop here or the loop here. It will give them different curves, really, because even if you start, if you see the direction here, I'm going to add something that is BA something something, and you know, one can prove it's not hard to see that we get two different curves. So we get double. Every, every simple curve gives me two of length L plus four. So here is the, the formula. Now, I'm not going to go through over the, this six free multiple classes of, uh, sorry, the six orbits, you know, and the are homeomorphisms of curves with some intersection two. I'm not taking, I'm looking at, you know, powers of curves. Uh, obviously, yeah, you can go twice around and get it, three times around and get it, and we do some intersections. So the first one is a little bit like the one we had before, where you go twice around the, the boundary and once around a single curve. Now, those, you can, how many I have of those? This one. Let's see. Oh, I'm doing a bad job if you can't answer that. Twice around the boundary and then a single curve.
The hint is, once around the boundary, and then a simple curve was two times order of the function of L minus four. <laughs> four times. No. Minus eight. eight times. No. <laughs> <laughs> minus eight. Minus eight. Minus eight. Minus eight. Yeah. Minus eight. Yeah. And it's two times because it's the same argument. If I have these two little loops where I can add twice around, yeah. but it's the same argument as before. Yes. So yeah, that's minus eight. All these ones, you know, can be computed. I didn't prove them all. It's a terrible confession. I proved some of them. And the way I know they are those is because, again, my computer told me. The, the homeomorphisms of the, I mean, in fact, the homeomorphisms are on the, on the quantum terms are well understood. And it's a very, you know, magical fact that if you look at the automorphisms of the fundamental group, they all come from a homeomorphism. I mean, they're all, they're all induced by homeomorphism. This is a unique surface that had, I mean, that had happened. All, all of them, you know, they have, the autonomous is much larger. And, uh, you know, we know the generators of the, the set of automorphisms is very simple. You know, it's just interchange two generators, my one generator to its inverse, and the other one to the other. There are three generators that, you know, one can compute. So I made my computer find for each of these types I may find the orbit and then I counted the elements. And it turns out that, well, it gives you this. So some of these one can prove, I mean, the L divided by two, for instance, one can prove two. This one I'm having problems, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this. It's the sum of two order functions. It also took me a lot of time to figure out even with my numerical evidence. Uh, but anyway, so here, here they are, the growth my volume. This again come. How many elements? Uh, how many homotopy classes? For instance, they have this picture you have and have world length L. So now let's look how many we have up to world length L, including L. So before it was equal to L and then it's up to. Well, it turns out that you know, if I add them all up, we have this formula for the order of free function. So it always is going to grow, this number D is the total, D L alpha grows like a rational times our constant, which is 6 divided pi squared times L squared. And the rational is there, you know, for the simple curve is 1, for the next one, you know, the one that has a loop around the boundary component is 2, and then, you know, this is this just follow directly, you know, from, from here, you know, I get the two nines, because when I add this, you know, I, I get a L divided by three squared, which goes there as a nine. So that's a number. And uh, so, now let's remember that, let's go back to Ms. Sakani's result. She was counting curves in any hyperbolic surface. Let's look at her result now in the torus with one boundary component with, with a counter. So she says that the growth, and now I'm giving a, well, I'm making her result more specific in some sense and more general in other sense, let me say it slowly. So it's more specific because I'm talking about the torus with one boundary component. But I'm making it more general because not only she study ultra densities up to a certain length, she study orbits. So how many you have that have a certain picture up to a certain length? In fact, she study all orbits and then add them up and that how she obtain uh, the result for all curves. So she study orbits. And the orbit, the, the result for the orbits, well, obviously had the same form that the result for, uh, for the total number of curves. So it's a rational times a certain number that depends on the metric times this uh, volume V11. And uh, my computer experiments strongly, really, really, really strongly suggest that we get the same rationals. So I'm going next week to Princeton, hoping to talk to her. We've been corresponding by email, but email is not working well. But she's surprised about this, and I'm, I'm sure it's right. So I'll let you know in my next colloquium. Okay, and this is another curious fact that I have to study, which is 
you know, one thing, you know, we saw that when, uh, if you look at the, the curves of surf intersection zero, there's only one orbit in the torus with one magnetic component. There's two uh, in the, with surf intersection one, six with surf intersection three, and there's 14 with surf intersection four. Well, if you add up all the Q's to y, all the rational numbers, you know, of all the orbits, you get numbers that are very close to this. This suggests it's probably more than a coincidence, you know. I mean, we do know that the number of orbits have to grow exponentially, but that's about, you know, how much we know. So that's more things to explore. I have more questions than answers in this talk. Okay, so now I'm going to change gears again, my last third. But I can answer any question. You know, I was just curious how do you do the computations on computer? Java. But I mean, I do Java and Mathematica depending for what. But I don't have a good read. I mean, I just, one day I put in, you know, I made a little program in Java, then it started to grow, and now it's so big that I can't change. It's just inertia. Okay, so here is more computer experiments. Now, we change surfaces. This is a pair of hands or sphere with three boundary components. And I'm going to organize the closed curves in the pair of hands by word length and self intersection. So first I'm going to look at it in the alphabet, you know, with this minimal set of generators, two generators. And uh, this, just there. You know, this is word length. So this says for word length one, and certain intersection zero, we have two curves, which are the two generators. I'm looking at unoriented. For word length two, and certain intersection one, you know, we have only one, because I'm not taking a powers. And so unoriented is, is only one. And so on. So this is, this is a table, a piece of the table. This is a bigger piece of the table. In yellow, the ones that are far away, there's a, there, there's zero, well, it's yellow, orange here, it's much more yellow in my computer. Uh, there are zeros, and uh, there's patterns there. One curious pattern that I have a undergraduate student, uh, Will, is looking at is that uh, if you look at it, it a column, this is for instance all the curves of intersection 8. So this says there's 2 of word length 17, there's 6 of word length 16, 12 of word length 15, and so on. Well, these numbers keep repeating. We have some, you know, idea of you know why it happens and how can we generate. I mean, it would be wonderful to you know be able to generate this these numbers. You know, the, the, this pattern is stop and stop at this precise precise place. You know, I had an awful thing with that. Once I gave a talk many years ago, and Ian Algo, who was so fast, was in the audience, and he said, oh, I have this idea, this number might be because of, and in the moment it sounded so good, and I totally forgot what he said. <laughs> and then I asked him, and he said, this is, looks so interesting, but I totally forgot what I said. <laughs> Maybe it's like a, you know, from last week or a new week behind. <laughs> anyway, so, so here is, you know, the, the you know, I free my lead with this surface. It's a pair of cans. It's a very, it's different from other surfaces in the sense that it has only finally many curves of a given self intersection. You can see, you know, it's not hard to see that there's finally many curves with no crossings because if you have a curve with no crossing, the pair of pants, and you remove it, what, you know, what can be the pieces topologically? You know, they don't have many choices. It has to be a pair of pants and a cylinder. So, you know, there's only, there's only three. And using arguments of that type, you can see there's finally many for each self intersection number. So I would really like to understand, you know, have a way to describe this sequence, how many you have for each intersection number. You know, the number is 339, 
2245, and I look at it in Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, and I did all the mathematical tricks that I could think of that I don't have a way to generate this sequence. So if anybody has any idea, let me know. But the, the way the I don't understand. The well, I don't know, yeah, but you can always wiggle out of better than it is exponential, so it seems like the approximate, but it, this is just to show it's exponential, but I don't think it's a really good approximation. It's, no. no, it's just, I need it. Okay, so now let's change, you know, I was talking to Tony, and Tony said, well, but, you know, the pair of pants have three boundary components, and to choose the set of generators, we're choosing two in an arbitrary way. Why two? You know, the three boundaries have equal standing. So let's make a table like this, but instead of taking the AB alphabet, take ABC alphabet, you know, generators are the boundary component. The three boundary components with a relation. So this is what you get when you do that. And then we look at this, and it's colored. It's colored because there are patterns. Because, and Kern, I'm going to join a little later when we're thinking about this. If you look at this red column here, the behavior is predicted by this quadratic polynomial, meaning that in the cell N, you will have, you know, cell L, you will have replacing L, and this will give you the number of curves. Now we made it up to as much as we can compute, and we have this quadratic polynomial. And, you know, we do have a proof. We need to, you know, brush it out. But here, this, you know, what this, this, we can prove completely and easily. Here we have, again, the or of the next diagonal is also a quadratic polynomial, and the next diagonal it is, and, you know, in fact, all the diagonals are a quadratic polynomial, and they also start this Square is when the quadratic polynomial kicks in, you know. Here I have, in this diagonal, at the 54, here is where the quadratic polynomial that tells me how many do I have kicks in. So. So meaning. What's that? Meaning 27 and 9 are not predictable. No, they don't work. No, they are not predicted by the polynomial. So here is a little bit of the first explanation of why we have the first, here is the first, the first diagonal that we look. So these are curves, you know, that, you know, well, let me just show the, the, the important thing with these diagonals is that if you subtract the, the self-intersection minus the word length is constant in each diagonal. So in this red diagonal, the first one is negative one, then it's zero, then it's one, two, etc. These are so when one looks at the, the difference, uh, self-intersection minus word length equal negative one, if you look at the short curves in this diagonal, well, the, the ones that have length two, two letters, are this one, A, B, B, C, C, A. I mean, this is one and you have to you know, rotate it to, to get to get the three of them. If you look at the one with three letters, well, they are here, and those are the one with four letters. That you can just prove, you know, by small brute force. Then, how do we get this quadratic polynomial? One thing you can observe is that if you have a pair of pants here, and you have a very long curve, and here, suppose I have There's one loop here. So, this blackboard is really bad. And my picture wasn't helping. So, let me go. Can you use a different color? That red is very hard to see. Oh. This Japanese. <laughs> so, this is a loop here. And the, the curve continues. Well, I can add one more loop. If I add one more loop, so adding one loop is the same as adding. If I, here I'm at, there's nobody, no piece of 
curve here. So I'm only adding one cross in this one and I add one layer. So I'm still in the same diagonal. The difference for length of intersection is still constant. So I move, you know, one stop here. And this is maybe the main point of why we have a quadratic polynomial. So how do we get it here? Well, I need a picture. Here, you know, if I, I, I start with this picture, and then I, instead of going once around the A, say you go a few times, and then you go a few times around the B. And if you want to say how many more lengths L I have coming from this one, how many do I have? Well, I have to go, the number of times I go around here, and the number of times I have to go around there, I have to add up to L, well, if I don't count this, L minus 2. If I, if I count this, it's L minus 2. Right? That, that gives me a linear piece. Now, what happens here? Well, I have three pieces where I can add. This is like <coughs> each, the trick I did here, I can do it in the three sleeves. How many do I have? Well, I have to add up to L. And this is I plus J plus K equal to L. And if you do a little, you know, a little counting, you know, the, in the same way that 1 plus 2 plus n plus n is n times n minus 1 divided by 2, this will give you that an L square number. And analogously with, with this one. And then you can also observe that, you know, you can do the, the backwards, you know, if you have a curve without more length and if you remove things, well, if you remove and remove words, you can always remove words when you are in the outermost place and you have this difference you really uh, end up with this shape. That's a little bit dangerous. So this is what happens when you have the difference constant minus one. The next diagonal, which is the difference, I should have written there, I didn't do the loops. This is the difference is zero now. The, the number of letters is the same as the number of certain intersection. These are the basic pictures, and then you can get them all by just going around this ones. And then it gets more complicated. The basic ideas are still the same, but the proofs are much more dirty. So let me do a very quick thing of, uh, again, another jump in my playing with my computer. Uh, so it's going to be a little algebra too. So let's start with a, in a free group. And you know, we say that two elements in a free group are trace equivalent if any time you have a representation of that group to S L to R, you know, you compute the two matrices, you compute the trace, you get the same absolute value, the curves are trace equivalent. The curves, well, the conjugacy classes or the thing. It's constant the conjugacy class. So, so although it's proved that you know this equivalence relation has, you know, has uh, classes which are as large as you want. You know, they have at least two to the n elements for each n. And I'll discuss a little bit, you know, quickly what is the uh, how to construct them. So then, now you can say that two free homotopy classes, topological, on a surface are length equivalent if. For any hyperbolic metric, any any metric you put in the surface, the length is the same. Of the, you know, if, you if you measure one curve with respect to that metric, and you measure the other curve with respect to that metric, you get the same number. I mean, when you vary the metric, the number will vary, but the pair is always equal. So, uh, let me know that these two relations are are the same. The same you know, the, they find the same equivalence classes. One side is complicated, the other is easy. And Randall proved in a paper that is very elegant, two pages, that you know for each positive integer uh, there are classes of at least two n elements, you know, of, of length equivalence classes. So this there are elements that you know are pretty interesting. The free multiple classes that you know you measure them with all the metrics and you always get the same. You cannot distinguish them with a with a metric. You know, I talked to Randall, his, the city, and said, oh, I read this very nice paper of yours. I said, which one? I, said, I couldn't remember the name. I said, it's very short and elegant. He said, oh, 
Oh, the pa papers are like that. <laughs> it was two pages, so of course we were sure, but it was very clever what he did. And then many people did algorithms in, in, uh, how to construct these length equivalence classes or trace equivalence classes. So this is one of the algorithms. The idea is very similar in all. You, know, you start with one, and you use the trace the trace relations to get two elements, you know, that's a little trick, some words that you replace, you get two elements that are trace equivalent. And then you repeat the trick with this, and here, and here, and you can open it up, and in each level, you get, it will get trace equivalence classes. So, I have two minutes. Let me just say one little thing. So you, if you look at the same words in the pair of hands and you interpret them as a you know, free homotopy class of curves or in the torus with one monetary component, well, the meaning is very different and you know, this, the same word gives you different curves. Here, you know, this word that I'm studying has a fit section 5 and this one has a fit section 4. So, you know, one question is, Suppose that you know that a pair of curves is length equivalent. Do they have the same sort of intersection? It seems such an enormous restriction that it should be. So then, again, in my computer, I will not compute the sort of intersection of these members of the equivalence classes. So this is zero. In this one, these two have four in the pair of pants. Um, no, it's five in the pair of pants. Five in the pair of class, four in the Hunter Torus. <coughs> the next class, you know, 47 and 83, and all the members of the class have the same sort of intersection number in the pair of class and in the Torus. The next is, you know, 725 and 1301. If you keep going, you know, the, the, the classes are very, very, very long, but they still have the same self intersection number. So, you know, we work here with some undergrad who did, you know, compute it, and, you know, we compute it up to six because those long words take a long time. It's the most we can do. They all have the same. And then Daniel Levani proved he's an undergrad. He was an undergrad. He's not at Penn State. He also proved that they have, uh, first, you know, he computed. And now he has to prove that, you know, this, if you construct this curves, you get kind of with the same sort of intersection. He's writing up every time I, you know, I'm almost there, almost there. So this is almost here right? because I didn't see the file with that, but you know, it seems it's correct. So it seems like it is. So I, I started with my uh, brute force approach, you know, of to finding length equivalence class. I have half a minute, I'll finish. So what I did is, you know, study with one single metric look at all the curves and separate those that have the same length for that particular metric. So I get some, some, some of them, you know, they are alone, but some, they, I have some groups of curves that have the same length for that particular metric. And then I study each of the groups with another metric, and then I partition that, and then I study with another metric. And after a few metrics, you know, there is a good, you know, by many, I'm done. So then, once you have two candidates that they can be length equivalent, there's ways to really test it. You know, it's very painful to do it for all the curves because you have to compute a certain polynomial that takes a lot of time, but two for two is fine. So I got two elements that are length equivalent, but doing that, I also try to find curves with different of intersection, and there are. And there are pairs of curves with different of intersection in both the pair of pants and the torus, but uh, these are all length equivalent. So this is just a little computer in the RTH. Okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Wait, that is wrong. So uh, just to see the uh, So basically, all the trace equivalent things, uh, length equivalent things that you get by algorithm. At the same yes, the but there are things that we cannot get. You know, people is try, are trying to find a, a general algorithm to find them all, but still clearly we don't know because all the algorithms have this, you know, 
characteristic that gives things to the sense of intersection. In fact, there's a survey written from another former Stonebrook student, uh, what's his name? Oh, gosh, I know him, he's in England now. It's a student of Bernie Maskett for the time of Barabbas Major. Okay, it's not going to come, that's what happens with age. Anyway, he wrote a very nice survey about all these trace equivalents and length equivalents. And in fact, we had this project to prove that they, they have the sense of intersection and then we found this example and said, well, maybe just abandon the project. Any other question? Okay, thank you again.